Is it only Arjun of the Yael that you channel or are there other extra dimensionals who also come through you as a channel? Sometimes some others hop on in, how do you say? <laughs> in the, they kind of like visit the chats for people. Like if they have a specific guide or wants to say something to them directly. But in most occasions, Arjun translates it for me still, or he's standing mm. in a sideline. And the reason for that is almost technical, I would say, because I understand that he is a split off of the same oversoul. He's a future self of me, quote unquote, even though of course he's his own person and I am my own person. But since we have um, a mutual origin on the long letter to source, you could say, we're, we're on a higher energy frequency. Like you share a soul, it's an over soul. And that's why it's easier technically for him to connect with me and for me to connect with him and for him to be the translator, even if other entities have something to throw into the mix. But it has happened. It has wow. happened. I'm having this interesting thought right now, you know, okay, I did not have a great childhood. I wouldn't want to repeat it. Let's just put it that way. And I understand it was for great purpose uh, for me to come through the other side with the choices I made and the healings I've done. I've always had this feeling that there was a future me that was go i think originally i would say there was an angel who was always with me as a child because that that's the only way i could have gotten through my childhood intact and as functional as i am mm -hmm. and then as um, my spiritual healing work has gone on over the last 13 years one of the things i've thought about is oh it maybe wasn't an angel it was me thinking this linear timeline in meditation and so forth, but just in energy, always being present with little Debbie. And now I'm listening to you and thinking, wow, that's so much bigger than what I had thought, because what if the same is true for me? That there was actually an aspect and a concurrent lifestyle or planet of me that has been hovering and making sure she's going to get through so she can be here to do what she came here to do and be. And then I'm having a little bit of a cool mind explosion with that oh, idea. I love that. Arjun actually says this is the case for everybody in one way or another. So since everything actually exists here and now, we all have future selves, obviously. Everything exists here and now. So if you think about that, whatever you're going to do tomorrow, she already exists. <laughs> I know it sounds like a mind boggle, but you know. So, and also, the reason that you can remember your childhood, and then in what a sense what you're doing when you remember something, this is how they explained it to me. When you remember something, you overlap your current energy frequency focus point with the focus point of that child. You are not that child anymore, but you can tune in with her. And then you feel like you think the child felt, mm. but you're creating it now in who you are now, right? So that's a memory. Mm -hmm. But when you think of the future and you ponder to make a certain decision, you don't know what yet, maybe you will get a new job or not get the new job, you're tuning in with it. Mm -hmm. Arjuna has explained to me when you tune in with something, there is a future version that has in fact already taken that decision and mm -hmm. they may flag back to you, don't do this, this is a horrible idea, or yes, do this. And when they say yes, do this, you feel an, um, excitement flowing through you. And when they say don't do it, you may feel anxiety for that reason or, or another one. You may have a negative belief about the job that doesn't serve you and then you have to clean up the negative belief. But in either case, when you tune in with something that is quote unquote in the future, you're tuning in with future versions of yourself. Mm. That is it's a whole new explanation of, you know, I've always said the one thing I've done right my whole life is follow energy. If I mm -hmm. left to my own devices, who knows the life I would have created. But if I just follow what is presented to me, and I can feel suss out, oh, this is exciting. I don't know why I want to do this. I know I want to do this. When I follow that, everything works out beautifully. So I love this explanation. It could be the future self coming back to inform me, you know, yep, that's a delicious path or that wouldn't work out so well. I can promise you I've been living it. That's what? so cool. This is so cool. You what? know, so you have this 
um, site that you've just developed. I want people to know about it because I know a ton of people have already been on starseedhub.com. Tell us a little bit about starseedhub.com. Oh, thank you for bringing this up. This is the biggest gift. Thank you so much. Yeah, so when I started do, doing the channeling work for other people, I, I ran into a lot of people, obviously, who've had ET contact experiences themselves in one way or another, who have felt really challenged by that and having this information and walking around with it and feeling just so super lonely. Because in our society, it is still quite a bit of a taboo subject to talk about. I understand that. I don't judge it. I don't fight it. But I'm very much for, like, my heart so goes out to these people because I've been there. I've been afraid to talk about the subject for a big chunk of my own life. And it just, the transformation that came with starting to open up was huge. Yeah, I, I had to switch, you know, like, friend circles, <laughs> you know, at some point. Uh, I've had to leave people behind, quote, unquote, who couldn't, you know, meet me on this level of information which is fine i mean it was always like in love and with uh respect that our ways parted in that sense so i and i can see how a lot of people are afraid of that you know being shunned and um ostracized mm -hmm. but um this website is particularly for people who feel alone in their um awareness of multi-dimensional connections that they experience has, that have helped them spiritually on their way. So whether I would say, of course, the emphasis here is on extraterrestrial, but multidimensional, I think you can all talk to each other. You know, I really do. So uh, from the beginning, I started doing this channeling work, which is about six years ago. I've had this dream in my heart. I was like, oh my God, I wish there was a platform that was 100% neutral that doesn't push any type of one path or one teaching, that just makes it a neutral playground for star seeds, people who've had these interstellar or multidimensional contact experiences to find each other so that they can meet up, have a cup of coffee and share. I mean, it is such a joy for our hearts to be able to share with somebody who knows at least a little bit what you've been going through. It's such a, you know, it's a homecoming. It's a celebration. And like I said in the beginning, I think this time is really about connecting, reconnecting and reaching out and seeing and experiencing in real life that you're not alone. So you can make a little profile, put yourself on the map. Um, little heads up to people who are curious about this. It's free. Um, if you make a profile, you have to fill it out because otherwise you won't show up on the map. So mm. fill out the profile. <laughs> so tell a little bit something about yourself. Give an indication of where you're at. You don't have to like put your home address, but if you have the guts, uh, more power to you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so step up and disclose yourself. I really believe that sure in the greater sense of the word isn't going to happen unless we are willing to disclose ourselves first so yeah this is something now that is out there you can go on it and check it out and see how many people in your own surroundings maybe um you know up for a cup of coffee or chats or you know whatever <laughs> love it so starseedhub.com if you want to go there and fill it out and um, it's, it's very cool interactive and you'll see your little star pop up mm -hmm. uh, you know the yayel are in their ancient language also known as the Shalanaya. Shalanaya, beautiful, which means those who come first. Mm -hmm. My question is, is it your understanding that the Yayel will be the very first ET civilization to openly meet with us here on Earth in person? There's a high probability, as I understand it. It's a really high probability, but it's not 100%. So they may be the first hybrid race to open up contact with us in this way. They're one of the five hybrid races that were created between the grace, the future humans that turned into the grace, uh, and us, now, nowadays humans, <laughs> where we are right now, this timeline. So five hybrid races were created. Are you familiar with this story? I, I am actually, but 
Do you mind if I ask you, because you mentioned that Grays originally came to visit you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious, are you a hybrid of Grays? And if so, because I understand there's three types of Grays. There's the short Grays, which are rather robotic and they just carry out the job. There's the uh, somewhat taller, maybe more human size uh, Grays, around five, six feet, who tend to be more connected to emotion, uh, better to connect with us. And then there are the very tall grays, seven feet and beyond, who are the more managerial, if you will, grays that can have all these properties and more. So is that true? And if so, are you a hybrid? And if it's a gray, which, <laughs> what size are we talking about or what type? And with what else are you a hybrid? Okay, okay. <laughs> Let me see. How am I going to answer this? <clears throat> so in my understanding, we are all hybridized. So first of all, the human species would not have existed were it not for hybridization. This is the so-called missing link that scientists are talking about. They can't figure out how we went from this more like ape-like being into suddenly walking all erect and being homo sapiens. That missing link was the Anunnaki or the Anu. So that's an extraterrestrial race, although it's not the grace. So that's how Homo sapiens was created. So that's a hybridization. There have been a little bit more hybridizations along the way, as I understand from our June, you know, a little pinch here and there. Um, and then there's one future timeline. So we're going to go into this future timeline thing again of a version of Earth where the humans turned into the grays. So it's a future timeline and it went kind of rogue and they went so strongly into um, science, mechanics. Um, well, there's nothing wrong with these things in inher inherently. It's just the way they used it. They really cut themselves off of their emotions. And that version of gray eventually, as I understand it, within all that is within the universe, if you walk a path that is strongly out of balance, nature will kind of course correct. So within all that is, the grace eventually discovered they couldn't reproduce anymore, not even by cloning. It was entirely impossible. Their DNA was basically at its end. So they realized, okay, the only way for us to continue to survive with our species is to tunnel back into time and to, well, use DNA from humans that still have viable DNA. Now, so that's something they couldn't do alone. So they were assisted by other extraterrestrial races, <clears throat> such as the mantids. You may have heard of these before. They played a major role in the hybridization project. So now when channelers are speaking about the hybridization project, they're usually referring to this project. Now, there was a sole agreement with every single person who was a part of this project. We've seen signs of it in our human history starting around the 1920s, 1930s. This is where you start to hear the first reports of people who have seen actual greys, both the little ones that you're describing and the taller ones. Um, but it didn't fully surface, I think, until the 60s, the 70s. Then there's this whole wave, particularly in America, where a lot of people start to open up about the concept, uh, which is beautiful, I think, and people can do their own research to look into that. Obviously, the density of these days was a lot thicker. I don't know how else to express that. Um, and the understanding of the people was more basic, more fundamental, and very often they felt uh, invaded. So that's where the term abduction came from. Because it, it isn't a very friendly term, and I understand there's a lot of fear around it. Mm -hmm. And I honor uh, the people who have gone through what they've experienced, that they've went through, because they were, in a sense, the pavers of the road on which it is now so much more easy to connect with multidimensional beings. The greys themselves are no longer uh, part of the hybridization project, the way it looks like right now, because it's done, basically. The five steps that were needed to quote unquote hybridize themselves back to as human as they could possibly get, uh, that's finished. 
the Yael are the fifth and the final race. So the children within the Yael species are called the Shalanaya, are specifically called the Shalanaya, and some of those that will come first. So am I hybridized? As I understand, um, these being a part of this project so i know i was a part of the hybridization project i know i donated my dna in mm. this time um runs often in family lineages so arjun has explained to me he gave me a little family tree and with that image bam showed me it's gone back like six generations or something where your ancestors have already met us or had encounters whether they remembered it or not um where they were fine-tuned and prepared for you to be at the level where you are right now and having this open communication in this way which was still optional and still is i mean it was an open invitation for me to work with them and it remains an open invitation so every day i choose to do it again and i love it <laughs> but a lot of people were part of this uh, a wonderful speaker on this what's her name again oh my god uh from australia you know this um little bit older woman uh mary rodwell <clears throat> she's a wonderful international speaker on the subject of hybridization and new age children mm. and she has collected data from all over the world hundreds of thousands of reports of people who've had or believed to have had these type of connections visitations or quote-unquote abductions um, but most of these experiences were actually very positive mm -hmm. and she is going through that data with a team of specialists and scientists um, to create reports so that people can look into this and I also really recommend her um, her talks on YouTube. She has some amazing lectures there for free for everybody to see if they want to. So it's not just me. And Arjun actually said, um, a roughly around a third of our planet, a third of our human race has been involved in the hybridization project in one way or another. So it doesn't have to be physical DNA that you were, you know, um, donating to them to the grades or to another hybrid species in between. Uh, it may have been an energetic donation. You can actually mm. donate energy, a part of your character uh, traits, or you may have been a teacher. There's people who weren't physically engaged in, um, you know, creating the new species, the new races, but that would go in their out of body or dream state and uh, help the hybrid children understand what life is like on earth some people do that in their dream times and they they wonder why am i always dreaming that i'm in front of a classroom and this might be it so there is a lot of layers wherein this is unfolding so i might be a little bit of a little bit hybridized <laughs> but i don't know to what degree i wouldn't be able to say but i know it's been you know the contact has been in my family line yeah very interesting a lot of times I hear people such as yourself who talk about this or who channel extra dimensionals and they will say, oh, you know, typically you will know you mentioned one third of the planet. Typically you'll know that's you because you grew up feeling really different, definitely different. Well, okay, I can identify with that. I felt incredibly different growing up. I still do to some degree, although I have my tribe. But I feel like that's not conclusive. So my question is, what are the signs? What are the ways that people can actually identify, oh, I think this actually makes a lot of sense and that's me because I fill in the blank. Hmm, wow. I don't really know how to answer that. Like I could say some things, but you know, the first connection, I think this is the more important part. The first connection that we all have is with our higher self. And the information that the ETs are sharing with us through channeling is filtered through that higher self. So we have a human over soul. You could say we're all connected in a human soul mm. that 
holds the information that we're always so in awe with when we hear some ET channeler share that stuff with us. Um, but what we're feeling is the reconnection to our own grander selves. Mm. And as I understand it, we're just super ready to reach beyond the concept of being just, you know, this lonely planet in the universe with the only one with life, like nobody else out there. We're just very ready to remember that we're more than just this. But so this is what I'm heading for. When you realize that, you may have, you know, um, an epiphany through during a meditation or in a workshop that you did or because you fall in love with somebody. It, it can be triggered by a myriad of things. Mm. But the feeling that you will have is similar to what I feel every time I connect with Arjun. So it's hard for me to separate the two and to say that oh, these are things that particularly make you potentially having been a part of the hybridization project. And these are things that particularly make you reawakening to your higher selves information because information wise, it's one, if you would ask me. Now, experience wise, it kind of depends on your age, I guess, where you're in the program or where you've been in a program. Um, I had an unexplainable fear for water as a child. I have some memories of um, the visitations where I was kind of put in a liquid, but you can breathe in it. But my rational mind battled it and I thought I was drowning, but I wasn't. <laughs> so the feeling that you're not being heard, having had, um, because your rational mind can't keep up with the multidimensional experiences, that is, waking up frozen, you know what I mean? Um, yes in this frozen body state and not being able to move or speak. Oh or my anything. gosh. This is a very typical thing for people who've had visitations in one way or another, uh, because you're now I understand what's going on. You kind of freeze your whole body. You're literally unable to move. It's, it's called sleep paralysis, I believe. Um, you do that because if you would allow the body to respond to what's going on in that moment, you would freak out. You would, you know, you could hurt yourself you would hit around you maybe hit into the wall which is still bad enough if you hit your hand or something so you're basically keeping yourself safe now the one that is doing that it's not the ets that freeze you over it's your higher self that has full understanding of what's going on in that moment and keeps you safe because it understands you're not ready yet to you know move around in that moment but as you relax into the idea of multidimensional uh, interaction, yeah. I had a lot of these sleep paralysis as a child, as a teenager, beginning of my 20s. Eventually, it relaxed. Now, I rarely still have that with encounters. And when I do, I realize, ooh, this is a whole new level. This is a new game. Um, this is an energy frequency that I'm newly being introduced to. So I'm using the safety belt again. And I'm not afraid of it. So it's something that eventually you will learn how to navigate and it relaxes. Knowing things before they happen, I would say is a typical thing, but you could also call that generally psychic. So there you go again, it's a bit blurry between starseed and, you know, waking up in general. Um, Having a very strong sensation that a presence is with you, that's a pretty strong one, I would say. No, like you said in the beginning with this angel that you felt there was a presence with you throughout your childhood. I've had some of these mo moments where I know Arjun was checking in with me already. Mm. The very, very profound encounter was when I was 14. I was walking on the street and I was in a super low mood. <laughs> and he lifted me out, he lifted me out of it. And that was extraordinary because the way my mind was working in that moment i was really like hmm i don't even know if it's you know if i should be on this planet i was like really low and you know puberty everything stuff going on and he just downloaded into my mind throughout taking two steps i know exactly where i was crossing the road i was crossing a road and he just downloaded into my system this full on understanding. Nature doesn't make mistakes. All that is wouldn't be complete without you. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. 
um, your whole, this is a sacred moment, as is any moment, it's up to you, you determine what meaning is in life by the meaning you subscribe to it. You're free in this. It was super self-empowering and I just got that in a split second and it changed my life. It was really amazing. And that's one of the first encounters that I consciously had with him, although I didn't know it was him. And I just felt, what just happened? Because I went from seriously blue to really optimistic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was unexplainable for the 14 year old me. But experiences like that, loss of time is a typical one. Um, what else? Of course, having had encounters, if you, I, I saw them walk through the wall. I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty strong indication that you had contact. So stuff like that. Or also maybe feeling your body has alterations to it when you wake up. You know, you may have been in a medical exam. They did have a lot of those. Um, and you could go to a hypno hypnotherapist to check in with certain remnants of little memories that somebody still has and dive deeper into them. But usually I always first, um, how do you say, um, recommend to people to just gently open up that conversation yourself. The reason that if, if you haven't had too many of these memories so far, but you suspect you might have been a part of this big cosmic play, mm. um, first maybe discover or investigate for yourself why you might have suppressed these memories. Is there a fear-based belief in the way? Um, because if there's a fear-based belief, it's less likely that you will allow these memories to resurface. So all of this journey really comes down to getting to know yourself. That's the point, right? I mean, that's why we're here, to get to know ourselves, to rediscover who we really are, how much bigger we are than quote unquote, just this, but just this is already amazing, of course. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then see if you can transform the fear-based beliefs into better feeling ones so that you open the gates for more memories and information to come freely to you. And remember that whatever, quote unquote, happened, um, it was by agreement. Your rational mind may not have understood what was going on. That's okay. That's completely natural. You may be sad and angry about that. That's also okay and completely natural. It's good to embrace everything that comes up. And it may also just be very loving and light and beautiful. It may also trigger a sensation of homesickness and feeling really alienated and what am I doing here? And that is so beautiful. And how am I ever going to move on from here? Now I know this is possible. All of that is part of the journey and bringing it back to your center, returning to yourself, seeing how sacred, beautiful and amazing you are remembering that that 
beautiful energy is a part of you and that you can flow it through you into the world. And you're not here by punishment. <laughs> Some people think that they came to earth against their will. Arjuna has very explicitly explained to me that that is not even possible. That's not possible. Nobody, you may feel that way because you started to believe along the way that you very sharply don't prefer some of the things that are going on on this planet today. And I get that, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to argue that. But if you don't judge it, you just observe what's preferred and what's not preferred and you don't judge it, then why would you conclude uh, or connect to that observation um, that you're out of place? Because that's a very, um, how do you say, limiting belief system for humans to have, as I understand it right now. It, it dims your light. If you say, I'm here against my will, I shouldn't have been here, this is all a mistake, incarnationally, this is a glitch in the system. No, it's not. How are you ever going to stand in your power if you believe that to be true? You see? So you have to anchor and love the fact that you are having a human experience. Human, you as in light, a glow, a human experience. That's amazing. Mm. There's light in every single one of us. So we're being invited to remember that and to see that. And this is probably the biggest passion of our June to and me together, I could say probably, to, to join forces, so to speak, and um, help spread that message on our earth today for whoever is open to listen to the, this particular source of information. Mm. That was a great description. And I hope people got a lot out of that. I, I have no recollection at all of being abducted or seeing anything, anything like that. But I will say what was rather arresting for me was when you described the not being able to get back in your body. When I was between the ages of 18 to 26 or 27, it happened repeatedly. The first time I remember I was 18, I had just moved from New York to California. I was going to USC. It was like my first week here. I couldn't wait to get to the beach and see it. I took a bus to the beach and I was laying on Santa Monica Beach and apparently I fell asleep and I woke up and I remember seeing my body in a bathing suit on the blanket and I could not stir my body. I could not make it move. I couldn't, I didn't even know if it was breathing. I couldn't get back in. I remember the terror and I remember feeling like a really, really, really long time, you know, until at some point uh, with a lot of effort and will, oh, I was able to pop back in. But it happened over and over where I would have what I would call, but what do I know? Um, especially then, like today would be so different. I would have a different, um, I would be very open, frankly, and very trusting and working with the energies back then. Like I didn't understand at all what was happening. And I would have these amazing experiences outside of my body. Not pleasant, frankly. Sometimes I was in a repeated, uh, beautiful, it should have been a beautiful home, but there were terrible things going on in many different rooms. And, um, I just couldn't come back. And I had it with, I remember a lion on a driveway meeting me and I was really frightened of it and things like this. And I got to a point where I literally made a conscious choice and said, no more. I am mm -hmm. never having this happen again. I'm mindfully choosing to not leave my body, to not have that happen. And so it is, right? <laughs> Very powerful. I think I did that too at some point because I started having experiences a little bit later on in my early, early 30s about presences. You know, I could sense things and sometimes they were dark and I was just like, yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, a lot of protection devices. So these pieces that you named were like, wow, I've never heard that described before. And I don't really ever talk about it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a old memory I don't even think about but I remember yep. <laughs> sounds like you had out of body experiences sounds like that to me like and I was afraid of it too in the beginning 
you know, to be, to seem disconnected from your body. It's not actually possible to not be able to go back though, mm. but you may believe that you're not able to go back. And then that belief will keep you focused outside of your body. It's hilarious because whatever you believe in the quote unquote non-physical immediately manifests as real. So you're not even aware of the fact that you're like, oh my God, I can't get back to my body. And you're completely manifesting in that moment, the idea that you can't get back to your body. <laughs> but then eventually, like you said, you, you have enough willpower to, to, you know, wham, you're back in it, right? Um, so you can actually flip a button. So there's a, a threshold between telling yourself something that's not preferred and realizing that that's not preferred and then actually debunking it. Mm. And that will allow you to go back. It's self-empowering. It's very self-empowering. A lot of our dreams, as I understand it, and I've had many nightmares when I was younger. Yes. Because I battled everything. And now I see, oh, well, have you ever? I created these nightmares because I was so full of resistance. Mm. And the environment reflect back to me my resistance and the resistance was just a logical result of the many many negative beliefs that we are all spoon-fed to begin with when we were growing up so you know your parents tell you that's not supposed to happen that's a weird thing oh nobody has that so the moment you realize you have that you get super concerned you know that's um very um manipulative in a sense of, of you know your experiences, but just imagine, this is what I love to do. Imagine a future version of earth where toddlers are being raised to realize that they don't just exist on the physical level, but that we are multidimensional beings. Mm. And at night you go and you play, you play in other worlds, you play with other beings, you may meet a friend, you may meet people that seem to be no longer alive, but since we are infinite beings, everybody lives on and you can still meet them there. You can meet them in your heart with intention, but also in your dreams. Imagine being raised with that. And then the amount of confidence and joy and exploration and data and intelligence and investigation, you know, like scientists, if they were raised to understand that you can find answers in the non-physical, of the lemmas that we have in the physical you know the world would be such a different place i love daydreaming about this this is basically how the yayel raise their children they realize this from the beginning on so they're much more evolved in that way than we are powerful and uh, i want to ask this last question before we invite Arjun to the show mm -hmm. to be with us. There are people, there are plenty of people out there who are free of fear, who are yeah. saying, bring it. Like I want, I know, I believe, I know. And I want to have this experience. I'm starting to get there a bit myself where it's like, okay, I, I, I know I feel I'll be safe. I feel like this will be a beautiful progression. I feel like if you exist, it is time to connect. But what does that take? Can somebody, does it have to have been an inception of a soul level contract and agreement? Or can we in real time invite it in? And if so, how? How do you mean in real time? You mean just like now? I mean, good question. Uh, not necessarily this moment now, but meaning in general, if people right now in their lives are saying, I would like this to happen. I would like a sighting. I would like to connect with a, an ET, you know, preferably safe ET, you know, from yeah. another planet, not, not maybe not a particular reptile. But, you know, I would like to have some experiences. I'm ready. Bring it. How can they send out the beacon or broadcast well, that they'd like to do this. It's kind of funny because as you're as you're um, putting this example together, um, you could do it that way, like right now. You could right now set out the intention. I think it's probably more powerful if you take a little time for it, like make a little bit of a space for it, uh, where you maybe meditate or you listen to good music or when you're super happy while you're walking through the forest and you're enjoying nature and to set it out then you know like a desire from the energy frequency that you're on in the moment when you're putting out the intention 
And this is why I would actually not recommend going <laughs> with this rational mind into details like, oh, but it has to be a friendly ET, so no reptilians. And by the way, that's kind of a little bit like racist, <laughs> no offense. Because <laughs> there is a lot of super kind reptilians out there. So, but in, in the old fashioned um, beginning stages of our understanding of extraterrestrials. Um, racist, oh my God. <laughs> no, it's okay, I'm sorry. Like I said, no offense. <laughs> sorry, reptilians, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But I understand a lot of people think that way, but it's, it, they have a bad rep, but it's unfair, you know, it is unfair, but it's our, it's so symbolical. All of this, this whole world of multidimensional extraterrestrial beings is a mirror of our souls. It's really important to realize that. So if you say, I like everything about myself, except my own fears and angers, what are you going to pull in? Right? So, if you're putting out an invitation, just say, I trust that whatever will come through will be good for me in the moment when it comes through. I will be able to use it. Just like I love bringing it down to earth. I love keeping this simple. Interacting with extraterrestrials in that sense, if you want to keep it really simple, like ABC kind of explanation, isn't that much different from interacting with another human being. You can usually sense when somebody has good intentions or when they don't. So just trust yourself. It's very much about trusting your own discernment. Now, the big difference between interaction with a human being and with an extraterrestrial is that the communication is telepathic. So you don't have to talk and explain stuff. Everything happens in a split second and whatever you think will be there right away. That's very different from our physical slow density manifestation unfolding system that we've got going on here. Or should I say when we're focused in this layer of creation. So that is different. But the bottom line, when people are like, oh, aren't you afraid that this is evil? you know it when it's quote unquote from bad intent you know it you can feel that if you trust yourself you will know that and then you can say no to it you know just like you said earlier if you had an encounter and it wasn't fun and you you're like oh i don't prefer this go away or stop or no you know easy enough and the response will usually be um more effective than with people <laughs> Because people are, you know, clingy and they're like, oh, but maybe like this, <laughs> I can still reach you with my bad vibes. And no, when, when you're up there, when you're focused in the astral and you see something you don't prefer and you're very consciously aware of that, you say no to it and it's gone. Bam, like that. Simple. But, you know, you're also the one who invited it. So it's good to actually realize that existence is a mirror so you perceive elements of yourself they may be highly out of proportion like you would never have recognized yourself in that way in the physical realm mm. but if something like that is what you encounter you needed an emphasized picture of something that was usually suppressed so this is where the quote-unquote negative experiences come from i don't see them as negative in the whole in the, in the bigger picture because hmm. they have to grow just like did your bad first boyfriend or you know your horrible neighbor was always in a mood or, i don't know just just giving earth examples right so whoever i can relate to that in the sense that you know if when i've done ayahuasca there's plant sacred plant medicine there's been times when things have come up through me that were not typically comfortable to look at. I mean, I will say the majority of my journeys have been amazing and fabulous. However, those moments, and they could have been hours because it's timeless, but when that has happened, I've never run, I've never resisted it. It's never been terrible. In fact, it's been enormously cathartic and I've been grateful for the release of that part of the journey too. So looking at it like that, you know, whatever's coming up is going out. And I would imagine it's the same when you're connecting with an extraterrestrial, extra dimensional, that it is the same. You know, there is some kind of purpose. And if you can just show up for it and experience it, and then like you're saying, you're in choice. You don't have to 
endure anything. You can say no. And um, so to have a wide, you know, sort of a widened back perspective about the invitation. I think I got the big line, the big outline, where you didn't resist things that, that you encountered during your ayahuasca ceremonies, right? At all. Anything. Right. Yeah. That, yeah, that's the way to go. Because if you bring in resistance, um, yeah, that's where your journey takes a different turn, right? So it's good to go with the flow and just see how things unfold naturally. Because it's our, this is a really nice thing to know, maybe for people out there that are still in fear. You will, the moment you don't engage with negativity, you, you retreat from that, you don't get sucked into the negative storyline or narrative, you will automatically navigate into the light. Mm -hmm. So the moment we stop doing anything at all, this is why meditation is such a powerful tool. When you neutralize yourself, in a sense, you start navigating into the direction of your light. And your higher knowing so you don't even have to you don't have to push that it's your natural state of being your whole system wants to be in the light and the higher knowing you're you're made of unconditional love mm. so it's actually an upstream journey to have a negative belief to begin with about something so if we engage in negativity it's a struggle and we all know that <laughs> so don't fight, just you know, embrace and love, compassion. Obviously, use your discernment and say no when you wish to say no. And if something happens that you don't agree with, it, I do think it's important to take action if you can. That's very important in our physical life. But um, if you feel that that's not your actual calling, but you're coming from anxiety more than excitement, then excitement for an alternative solution, then don't go into that direction. So it, again, it all comes down to knowing yourself and seeing if whatever you think calls you is something that really calls you or not. Oh, and that actually brings us back to your original question. Um, can you just ask for a sighting or contact? Yes, you can send out the intent from a good place, good energy, uh, but then let it go. Mm -hmm. That's my advice, drop it, actually drop it. So you may want to see a sighting and connect to this wonderful, wonderful CE5 network by Stephen Greer or something to, you know, hook up with other people to, to see UFOs and meditate them into our reality uh, awareness um, or invite them. That's a better way by meditation, better way to put it. Um, but then, you know, or, or do something else, listen to another channeler, but eventually all this information is already inside of you. It's already in you. So as you're setting up that intent, you're actually saying, I want to get to know myself better and in a grander way. And whatever way is relevant for you to get to know yourself by in a grander way will then appear. And it may be that you have a really interesting dream or an out of body experiences, like you said before or that little freeze over sensation. And then that will tell you, oh, wait a minute, I'm in contact with higher dimensional energies. So it may manifest for many people in many different ways. Synchronicity may accelerate. And by that, I mean positive synchronicity, um, double numbers everywhere. I mean, 1111, they, they should start their own movement, so awesome. <laughs> right? Okay. Yes, without a doubt. Uh, for me, triple numbers, that's really it. Three, 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 a lot of that. Uh, I have a lot of sevens in my life as well. Uh, but you know, it's all interesting and custom tailored. So that's why it's so important that we share because the more angles of perception we have, the more complete our grander overall understanding of this type of multidimensional context can become. With that, I would ask for you to let us know what we can do to best prepare and invite Arjun of the Yael to come be with us right now. I am, I am with great anticipation, extremely, extremely excited and, um, and want to make this a beautiful, warm experience for Arjun and for you and for us.